The Global Energy Leaders Podcast, Episode 74. Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray. So good to have you today. We have on a guest from Iceland, a place that I would like to go and visit but never have. And we are talking about geothermal energy and would love to hear your thoughts at the end of the interview with the question of the day segment, which will be right after the interview. So stay tuned for that. We have on today Alexander Richter, who is the founder and principal of ThinkGeoEnergy.com. He is also the president of the International Geothermal Association. Now, going into this, I didn't know a whole lot about geothermal other than what I had read online and seen from uh, snippets here and there. So really enjoyed the discussion with Alexander, and I hope you do too. Uh, Without further ado, here's my conversation with Alexander Richter. Alexander, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Doing very fine. Thanks for having me. Well, we've had on guests from around the world, but I think this is the first time we've had on someone from Iceland. And so uh, this is kind of a unique experience for me. And just for the listeners, kind of give, a, give us a, um, this is being recorded on July 24. So what's the weather like in Iceland right now and what's going on up there? Well, it's uh, the, the time of the year when, when Iceland is actually not, not as cold as, uh, as, as people uh, think it is. It's uh, relatively warm right now, probably in the from about 20 degrees Celsius, which is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, really warm and we have uh, beautiful days. But uh, normally the, the weather is a, bit, is a bit, bit more on the fresh side, given that we are based in the North Atlantic. Yeah, we were talking offline here, and you were saying that 70 degrees Fahrenheit was warm, and I said, well, it's 100 in Texas, so that that actually sounds pretty good right now. But let's get into it today. You're on to talk about geothermal energy. Kind of set the table for us. When we're saying geothermal energy, what's a good definition and way to think about that term? Well, I guess in in, in, in general terms, people people hear geothermal energy, and they, they, they think mostly about the, the heat pumps people have maybe in their backyards. But geothermal energy is 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 is, is way more complex in, in a sense. Um, it is a natural uh, resource taking the heat from the earth. Uh, so essentially, the, the 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 center of the earth, the, the core of the earth, is basically very very hot. So we have uh, thousands of degrees uh, uh, temperature in the center of the earth, which which you can kind of experience like with volcanoes, for example, when some of this heat kind of comes up to the surface. Uh, you can see this in Hawaii or um, uh, in, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere where you have volcanic activities. So the earth inside is very, very hot, uh, and that's basically geothermal energy. And depending on, on how close it is to the surface, you can actually tap into this energy for, let's say, power generation and heating and, 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 and other um, energy utilization forms. So in a sense of, of utilizing, utilizing this heat as, as, a, as a form of energy, you're normally kind of drilling for water. So water basically that is kind of sickering through uh, the ground into, into the earth uh, is basically just like in the oil and gas sector, kind of in reservoirs, fractured uh, zones of, of the earth, uh, heated up by the, by the hot stone. And what you do, you drill down into these uh, reservoirs to derive the hot water. And you, you take the steam from that hot water to turn a turbine and thereby generate electricity. Or if it's not hot enough to kind of create steam, you can l- utilize that hot water for, for heating, for example, in greenhouses or in, in houses, or you can use it for bathing. Uh, maybe some of you know the thermal spas, uh, where you kind of derive hot water, hot springs, for example. And uh, you can also kind of use this in, 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 uh, in all kinds of other forms, for example, for um, all kinds of industrial applications uh, that are utilizing heat. So it is a it is it is a renewable energy form. So you kind of tap into into this water pockets. Uh, you 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 take the water out, and in most of the cases you re-inject again. So you refuel that reservoir, and by the hot stone, it's it's basically been reheated again, and you basically create a sustainable uh, renewable system that you can use on a on a on a, on a long term basis. Okay, let me let me jump in there real quick. Just just get a couple of clarifications here for myself and the listeners. How deep are we drilling? And I know you said it kind of varies, but um, in an optimal situation, what kind of depth are we looking to drill to? So essentially, that that's the point. I mean, you can you can drill um, in in feet. It's probably between. Uh, I mean, for, for 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 heating purposes, where you don't need that much of of a high temperature, uh, you can drill uh, probably in, in some some occasions, kind of six hundred feet. 1200 feet um, or, 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 or more 
uh, and you can reach uh, uh, depths of up to 10,000 feet. But the question is if it's economical, because the cost of drilling is relatively high. And that basically determines where geothermal energy for power generation is being utilized. It's basically where the heat is kind of found more closer to the surface. And that's when you can utilize it. And that's, for example, the difference with the geothermal energy for the heat pumps, which I mentioned earlier, is the heat pumps that we're using in the, in the traditional sense and, uh, in, in houses or backyards, you, depending how deep you go, but normally you kind of like, you don't use it as a, as a, as a per se energy form. You use it as a, as a, as an energy form where you can utilize that, that consistent heat of the ground. But it's not that high that you would kind of utilize it directly. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm following along here. So help me out with this. Um, you, you've kind of talked about a couple of different uses here. What temperature is the water in the ground? And then, um, you know, how much, how much of the heat does it lose coming from the ground, you know, up to wherever it's going to the surface level? So, so that's, 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 that's the point, uh, how you would, uh, look at, at, um, at different temperatures. So for example, for heating, for heating purposes, uh, let's say in, in houses, or whatever, you need a, a temperature of, of between, uh, 40 degrees Celsius, which is about 100, uh, degrees Fahrenheit up to kind of 70 degrees Celsius. That's about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is sufficiently hot water that you can utilize in greenhouses to heat up greenhouses or even kind of send this hot water through your radiators uh, in your homes to, to heat it. Uh, and that's a very common, for example, use in, 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 in Europe. Um, for power generation, you need temperatures that, that, that is above that temperature. You need about 180 degrees Fahrenheit to kind of utilize it for, for power generation. But the technology at, the, at that temperature, uh, to, that you need to kind of utilize it for, for power generation is relatively expensive. So it depends when you are in a, in a location where, where uh, electricity is very expensive. Let's take Alaska, for example, where you pay 40, 30, 40 cents per kilowatt hour, then a relatively high cost power plant for, for, for geothermal would actually still be cheaper than diesel generated electricity ge- generation. Um, so, but in the traditional sense, like in, let's say in, in Iceland or in, in, in the, in the Western United States, for example, in California, you would look at, uh, a probably 480 degrees Fahrenheit and up. Okay. So let's talk about just the power plant side of things for, you know, um, large scale usage. When we, when you talk about drilling into this to, to get to the water, how many, uh, for like a power plant or, or whatever you're going to use it for, for large scale, how many times do you have to drill into the earth? Is it just one drill and then you can, you know, siphon it out of there? Or is it multiple drills or how does that work? So, I mean, essentially it, it depends actually on the resource. But, but traditionally when you drill that deep, you naturally kind of want to kind of drill as few holes as possible because every hole that you drill costs three, four, five million dollars right. depending where you are. So naturally kind of every hole that you drill makes the power plant more expensive. So, but traditionally, kind of, you, you, you derive everything from two to four or five megawatts per well. And there are wells that are more productive that go up to 10 in, in Indonesia, for example, up to 20 megawatts per well. But, but traditionally, you, you, maybe three to five megawatts per well that you drill. So, for example, for a power plant that has a 50 megawatt capacity, you probably need, um, uh, producing wells about, uh, let's say 10 to 15. But then you kind of uh, add, uh, drill an additional four or five wells for reinjection. Gotcha. And, and one final thing on the reinjection, I'm, I'm just curious about this. Um, does it matter if it's um, salt water or fresh water when you reinject it, or, or uh, does that even play a role, or does it have to be potable water? What are your options when you reinject to the well? So, it that that is a legis- legislative issue with regards to the the, the, the uh, environmental issues, but. What you traditionally have in the in the in the geothermal reservoirs, the water has a, a very high uh, mineral content, uh, so-called brine. Um, so, for example, in, in, in the in the Imperial Valley, there's a lot of acidity in the water that you kind of derive from the from the earth. So, in, in many cases, for example, like uh, like rare earth material like lithium can be found in in this brine. Um, so, the question is, what is permitted, kind of to kind of to to to, to fuel back into the reservoir but traditionally basically you you only kind of what you pull up you kind of put down again so it's not it's not drinkable water gotcha gotcha so you you have some flexibility but depending on the environmental regulations yeah yeah correct that's that's correct okay so this kind of hearing as you talk about this some of the the pros and some of the cons it sounds that the geothermal has a spot in the industry but 
it doesn't sound like it's going to be the predominant spot. So what role does geothermal, in your opinion, play in the larger energy spectrum? So, so here's here's the point. Geothermal energy is, as I, as I mentioned earlier, kind of predominantly currently being used in areas where you can find this form of energy relatively closer to the surface. So as we know, the Earth has tectonic plates. And where these tectonic plates meet, you find volcanic activities and the heat of the Earth closer to the surface in the form of magma. Uh, one of those uh, these areas, for example, in these tectonic plates is the, the San Andreas Gap, which kind of goes down from Alaska uh, on the west coast of the U.S. Uh, through California, down through Mexico, and basically all the way down to South America. So that's one of that's the, the, the one of the, the the where the tectonic plates meet, and then you have these 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 kind of tectonic plate gaps basically going uh, around the Pacific, and that's what we call the Pacific Ring of Fire. It goes then uh, from Alaska over to Russia, down to Japan. Japan is also known for volcanic activities. It goes down to the Philippines, to Indonesia, New Zealand, and then basically kind of in South America, it goes up on, on fireland. Uh, Chile, basically all the way, all the way up, and then and the and um, and then you have a similar tectonic uh, gap uh, in, in eastern Africa. So that's basically where most of the heat kind of is closest to the surface, and that's why you have predominantly today geothermal power plants in these regions that ha- that have have this have this possibility. But there are more and more places where you still have heat. You need to drill deeper. It's more costly, but it's still a valid energy source. For example, in Nevada. Uh, where you basically kind of don't have the high temperatures that you have in California, but it still makes sense because you can you you can drill and you can you can generate power at a relatively cost competitive competitive price. But in the overall scheme, like geothermal is is essentially like I said before, it's it's essentially possible everywhere. It's just a cost issue. So that's why like today you find it mostly in those volcanic areas and a little bit beyond. And I think that's will mostly kind of will stay that way. So the, the overall growth potential for geothermal is relatively limited to these kind of high temperature regions. And that is, for example, East Africa. It is, uh, Southeast Asia, for example, Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, it is, uh, South America, Central America, the Caribbean. Um, uh, but what a lot of Americans don't, don't know is that the U.S. today is the largest country with regards to, to geothermal power generation. And but that's mostly folk, that's mostly located in the in the western United States and in uh, in California, in Nevada, Utah, uh, Oregon, and there's uh, some development kind of trying to figure out to utilize uh, geothermal from from old oil wells, for example, in Texas. But overall, like I said, it will not play this this huge role and kind of present, let's say, five to ten percent or percent of the overall energy supply in the future. But it will play a significant part in specific regions of this world and in the United States. So, for example, today, like in, in California, geothermal quite often represents, I think, up to 50% of the renewable energy supply in California at certain times of the day. Because the, one of the biggest advantages of geothermal is, is that it's a, it's a baseload capacity, so it provides power 24-7. And, and in that sense, it is kind of a very complementary kind of source of energy or renewable energy source in the in the context of the intermittent resources like like solar and wind well that you know it's a lot of interesting stuff that you've kind of touched on there i want to i want to focus on the drilling real quick just just out of curiosity here you know one of the things that we'll see in the oil and gas business is you know the cost of drilling and it looks like over the past few years that the cost of drilling you know kind of goes up and it's been down at least as far as the day rate is concerned is there any correlation to the cost of drilling uh, and, and technology that's used uh, to to advance and, and lower the cost for oil and gas drilling for geothermal. So, is there any relationship to maybe if we see oil and gas drilling prices go down, uh, would they necessarily go down for geothermal? It's a it's it's an interesting question that we always that we always get, and and they are in the, geo, the, the geothermal sector is probably the closest technology wise to the oil and gas sector because the drilling plays such a significant part. So any technology development in the oil and gas sector reflects goes back into the into the into the geothermal sector. Um, so, uh, for example, a lot of the the, the drilling activities in, in the United States is actually done by companies that drill for oil and gas as well for geothermal. So that you have that crossover of technology. Quite often, though, is, is that the the geothermal sector doesn't have the necessary funding to apply the uh, the best technology. Quite often, um, because it's 
we just simply don't have the funding in the oil and gas sector. Because the problem in geothermal, and that's, that's one of the, the biggest adva- uh, challenges for the sector, is that, that geothermal is a utility business model and oil and gas sector is a commodity business model. So the, 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 the return that you have from an oil and gas well is much higher and much quicker than it is from a geothermal well. Uh, and that makes the whole business case very different. But as you said, the, the crossover of technology and, 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 and prices basically goes, comes, comes in from the oil and gas sector as well. But one, one thing that is very interesting is that, for example, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the current down, downturn in the, in the oil and gas sector is that you would expect that prices would go down much more and that the geothermal sector could profit from it. But that's, that has unfortunately not really been the case. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next, you know, handful of years because uh, if you look at the oil and gas industry right now, oil's hovering around, you know, forty-five to fifty dollars a barrel, and so they're they're trying to figure out new and new uh, new and creative ways to lower the drilling cost so they can make the break-even point stay even lower than what yeah. it currently is. And so uh, it'd be interesting to kind of watch this to see how how you know some of these industries you know translate from one to another because in the information age we're at now, you have a podcast like this, and so one of our listeners, we have listeners all over the world, might be listening, and going, you know, I wonder if we took that and applied it here, so. And especially, yep. especially when you look at stuff like big data and the Internet of Things, all the technology that's we're really just on the cusp of, um, it'll be fascinating to see three, five, seven years um, how industries change. And what, what I like about energy is, and you kind of said today, is that there's some that, that, that there's a spot for a lot of different things. And so um, geothermal has a spot. It has a spot that can be used in the world. It's just making sure that we use it wisely in the right spot and not try to take it to somewhere where it's not going to be profitable because that kind of sets the industry back. And so uh, I appreciate your honesty it's- and your candor. Exactly. So, but, but for example, one of, one of the things that is very, very interesting is that what a lot of people don't know is that up to 60, 70 percent of the fluid coming out of an oil, of an oil well is actually water. And in many cases, actually hot water. And for the oil and gas sector, that's waste. Mm -hmm. But for someone who works in geothermal sees, sees the potential of what, how we can utilize this hot water. So, for example, the efforts in, in, uh, underway in, uh, in Texas and in, in Alberta and Canada, uh, where actually people look at how to utilize these, these abandoned wells, which have a lot of hot water that could be tapped into, where the wells are already drilled, um, and then figuring out a way to kind of utilize that hot water for power generation or heating. So there's a lot of untapped potential uh, uh, and, and crossover from oil and gas, as I mentioned before, also in the already drilled oil wells. That maybe have been abandoned because water basically is not what oil and gas drillers are drilling for. They're drilling for, right. for the oil and the water is just basically waste. But there's a possibility utilizing that water for, for power generation. There's just so far been not much interest by the oil and gas sector kind of to, to tap into that. But in the current scenario and with the low oil prices, actually people understand that there's a value in those wells that, that have been drilled and are currently not being utilized. So there's an, there's an opportunity and. And maybe that's kind of opens opens the other point that I that I made earlier is that we always talk in geothermal we always talk about power generation and that's in the in the over renewable context very interesting and very important but what is in 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 an international context even more important is heating so for example in in, in Europe about nearly fifty percent of the whole energy demand in Europe is actually for heating and cooling and today worldwide for example in China and in Poland and elsewhere you still heat with coal. With all the, the, the emphasis of cleaning up the air, for example, in China, where a lot of coal is being used for heating and you have a huge health problem and uh, an emission problem uh, uh, and challenge in, in, in cities like in Beijing, where there are, there are people look at ways of cleaning up that heating sector. And geothermal is seen, in particular in China, as the energy source that could clean up the air and kind of provide a renewable energy form for heating. Because and that's basically where geothermal probably can play the most impact in the overall renewable energy perspective. And that is something that is quite often completely underestimated in the, in the American context, but in the European and Asian context is absolutely important. And uh, that's something that kind of, like we internationally kind of always kind of like, like, like promote and, 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 very much like to talk about because that's that's where geothermal really provides a very competitive business model compared to anything else. Well, Alexander, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this discussion. It's uh, eye-opening for me as I learn more about geothermal. Um, you are the president of the International Geothermal Association, so I want to give you a second to plug and promote that in your company and anything else that you have today before we let you go. Thank you. 
So yeah, I'm I'm the president of the International Geothermal Association, which is the international representation of all the uh, national uh, geothermal associations worldwide. So we're the international representation. Uh, we're promoting geothermal uh, through research, uh, through education, um, and and creating uh, information and knowledge. I am uh, elected president uh, for three years. Uh, I have a very good board behind me, but I personally work uh, privately uh, maintaining the largest geothermal news website called thinkgeenergy.com. We're also having a Spanish website and a, and a Turkish website providing based news about the global geothermal development. And I also work as a, as a consultant for a variety of companies, for example, for a, a British company, we're building uh, well at power plants, utilizing kind of individual wells for, for, for power generation on a, on a smaller scale, helping kind of in a creative way to kind of speed up development. So that's, that's roughly kind of like my, my background in the, in the industry. Well, great. Well, we will link to thinkgeoenergy.com in the show notes so the listeners can check that out. We will also link to the International Geothermal Association so people can find out more information about that association as well. And I need to book a trip to Iceland just because it sounds like a great place to visit. So I um... just have a, <laughs> just to give you a good idea, kind of uh, Google the Blue Lagoon Iceland to yeah. give you an idea about geothermal and what it can do. Awesome. Well, Alexander, thank you so much for coming on, and we look to having you look forward to having you on again in the future. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Alexander for coming on today. Um, enjoy the discussion. Question of the day. Shoot me an email, ryan at globalenergymedia.com with your answer. We will read them on the air. What do you think? Does geothermal have a place in the energy sector or is it just too expensive? Can we figure out the dynamic and the balance between uh, profitability or is it something that's just eventually going to fade away? Ryan at globalenergymedia.com would love to hear your thoughts. We will read your answers on the air when we get them in. The Global Energy Leaders Podcast is produced by Michael Sims and Chris Prine. Chris Prine also serves as editor for the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. Until next time, keep climbing. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R-Squared Global. 